My name is Alex Caserta, and I come from an Italian heritage where food is given a high priority. This show provides the inside stories of the individuals in the food production industry and how they are producing food using an artisanal approach and innovative techniques. The entrepreneurs of the food industry will provide insights into food production, nutritional value, and the farm-to-table movement. Gotham Greens is a leading fresh produce and food company offering a line of leafy greens, herbs, salad dressings, and pesto dips. They are new to Rhode Island and a pioneer in the field of urban agriculture. Their new 110,000 square foot facility uses a new way to farm, produce local food, and revitalize communities. They are moving the growing process from the farm to the city. I'm in the Providence location for Gotham Greens with Viraj Puri, who is the founder of Gotham Greens. And Viraj, um, you don't come from a farming background. I don't, I don't. I don't come from a f farming background or a food or an agriculture background. In fact, I studied sustainable development and environmental science uh, in my undergraduate degree. But, you know, from a young age, I've always sort of been drawn to the environment and the outdoors and conservation efforts. And uh, I knew I wanted to dedicate my career to some sort of um, causes and ventures that would address yeah. a lot of the issues that, that the world faces. But I, I certainly didn't think of agriculture. And it was actually while working at an environmental engineering firm in New York City in the early 2000s that I got staffed on a greenhouse project. Yeah. And that was really my first exposure to controlled environment farming as this technology is known. And I just became fascinated with it. I, I thought it was such an amazing and resource efficient way to grow highly perishable oh. fruits and vegetables using a fraction of the resources compared yeah. to conventional farming. And it was during that project that um, I did some research and it was just staggering for me to learn what an enormous impact modern farming has on, yeah. on natural resources and the environment. Um, agriculture is the largest consumer of land on the planet. It's the largest consumer of fresh water. It's the leading cause of global water pollution and is responsible for about 25% of global carbon emissions. So. Yeah. It just dawned on me that we're going to have to feed more mouths in the years to come with finite resources, dwindling yes. land, dwindling water, and how about this great technology to do it? I so know. That was, that was 11, 12 years ago, uh, and now we have a network of these farms across the country. Uh, when did hydroponic growing actually begin in this country? On a commercial scale, probably in the 70s. Uh, 70s. Much of this technology was developed in the Netherlands, and, and, and Dutch um, immigrants to the United States and Canada brought a lot of this technology over. The Netherlands is a small landlocked country, but they're a net exporter of food, and they really pioneered a lot of this controlled environment technology. But it wasn't really widely deployed on a commercial scale in the U.S. until sort of the 90s and the early 2000s. Um, and the industry really started off focusing on um, vine crops like tomatoes and, and, and cucumbers and you know my partners and I really saw an opportunity to get into lettuce and leafy greens you know yep. lettuce and leafy greens a uh, huge market uh, uh, in this country right it's, yes. it's, it's tens of billions of dollars so it's uh, people don't realize how much lettuce we consume and 98 percent excuse me of that production comes from two growing regions one in Salinas, California, and the other in Yuma, Arizona. It's a highly, highly centralized oh, okay. um, production system. Mm -hmm. And then that requires that all that fresh lettuce has to be transported all across yeah. the United States and Canada. And so getting up here in New England, 4,000 miles away, yeah. takes a week. Yeah. So a lot of New Englanders probably when they buy um, non-local lettuce yeah. are probably used to that product only lasting for just a couple of short days in their fridge and if they don't eat it right away they're probably throwing it out. Uh, so they've become adapted and, and accustomed to buying products that may not always be of peak nutritional value and their taste buds <laughs> have also become accustomed 
to eating that type of product. And they don't always notice the difference unless they have something that's grown locally. That's yeah. exactly right. By growing food locally, not only are we supporting our communities and spending our dollars closer to home and creating economic development opportunities and jobs, but from a food standpoint, we're eating fresher food, which is going to be more nutritious, yes. it's going to be more healthful, it's going to taste better, and it's going to last longer, if done well. Everything that you see in this greenhouse, so we harvest seven days a week, 365 days of the year, or maybe you take a couple days off for yeah. national <laughs> holidays, uh, but it's on a supermarket shelf or a restaurant plate, sometimes within 24 hours of harvest. So that's gonna be two, three extra weeks of shelf life that's gonna be passed on to the end consumer for a better experience. We're in the heart of the city here, and a lot of our greenhouses are in the hearts of cities, and that was a very conscious decision because we wanted to impact the supply chain in a very real way, but we also symbolically wanted to bring people closer to their food. And it feels like there's a little bit of a cultural zeitgeist that's going on now with the younger generation certainly caring more about climate change and its impacts. It felt like a really important time to not only innovate for a sustainable future, but tell that story. And we felt like by being in an urban area, we could tell that story to a larger audience where people can just drive by this greenhouse. I mean, we're right, yeah. off, the, right off 95, we're right off the Amtrak, that goes from you know yeah. Washington to Boston. Tens of thousands of people are seeing this greenhouse every day. Yeah. And then maybe they're seeing Gotham Greens lettuce on a restaurant menu yeah. or in a local market or a chain supermarket. And I think it just is provocative. It gets people to ask questions and then ultimately um, support, uh, support local farmers. And the other interesting thing is it's hard to find farmland in cities, yeah. right? <laughs> but the beauty of this type of production system is we don't need a lot of land. We don't need arable land. We don't need fertile soil. What we can grow in this three acres of greenhouse would require 90 to 100 acres out in the field. And so we need a lot less space. And because we're growing hydroponically and not using the soil, we were able to repurpose an old General Electric um, factory that employed thousands in its heyday. Yeah. And that went, went out of business and this neighborhood and this area suffered sort of from this urban blight. And the site lay vacant for 20 plus years. Yeah. And we were able to come in and partner with the city of Providence and the state of Rhode Island to help remediate the land. We acquired the site from, from General Electric uh, and now have created over 60 jobs and invested you know, over $10 million to produce this beautiful facility, producing healthy food and, and good jobs. And we like to con connect with the community and bring them in so they can see how Absolutely. their food is grown. I'm with Nicole Baum at Gotham Greens. We're out on the patio, uh, which is situated right on Harris Avenue. You can hear the traffic. You can hear the traffic <laughs> and listen to the cars go by. And what do we have across the street? <laughs> we have, yeah, Route 6, and we also have the Amtrak train, which yep. might come rolling by in a couple of minutes. So we are in an urban setting um, with a greenhouse, which is what you don't typically see in a city. Totally. Now, uh, Nicole, uh, your job responsibilities uh, work around what type of things? So I'm the Director of Partnerships and Business Development at Gotham Greens. Okay. Yep. And that involves everything from working with our food service and retail customers, as well as, you know, in advance of our opening new greenhouses, coming in and really picking out community partners. So you flew in from Denver, Colorado for this interview. Yes. And even though you are a native-born Rhode Islander I am, and yeah. grew up yeah. here, yeah. Uh, you've moved around. So we started in New York City, yep. and we have three greenhouses there. And now we have two in Chicago, one here in Providence, which services the New England area, um, Baltimore, which is the Mid-Atlantic, yep. and then Denver, we have a greenhouse, and we're getting ready to expand to the West Coast to California this fall. Now, who are yeah. some of the um, community-based organizations that you're working with um, in Rhode Island here? So here in Rhode Island, um, we have a couple partners that we work with, particularly around food access. Yep. So Amos House, um, Chef Mike, yep. who's coming by today. Um, he's a wonderful partner. And actually, I met his team you know, 20 years ago, and I grew up here and was volunteering with Amos House. Okay. Um, so it was really cool to be able to like come back 
number of years later. Yes. And you know, really be able to give back and connect with them. We also work really closely with the Rhode Island Food Bank, and you know, this past year with COVID, you know, that, that food access has never been more important. So yeah. we really work with them every single week, and we every week put some product aside to make sure that it can go out to help provide year-round fresh produce to our neighbors who are in need. And also hiring people in the community to work in the greenhouses. Our model from the very beginning has been we want to create farms close to consumers so they know where their food is coming from and you know we do things like virtual tours in the era of COVID but yep. hopefully you know we're looking forward to the days when we can welcome our community back to our greenhouse and they can see inside and really get a true understanding of where their food comes from and um, how you know the care that goes into growing them. Yep. Yeah. Now we're sitting in front of a bunch of seedlings what do we have here for a plant? So this is our butterhead lettuce Okay. and this is a you know, baby seedling. It's probably about like maybe two weeks old. Feel free to grab one. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually made of peat moss. And if you look at the bottom here, you can see that these are actually the roots. Yeah. So we're growing hydroponically. And the idea is that instead of using soil, all of the nutrients that the plant needs is actually dissolved into the water and then runs underneath the roots of the plants. So rather than having to create this like really complex root system, the plant is actually getting all the nutrients it needs right at the roots. So it spends its energy building the plant instead. You do this on a year long basis. Absolutely. So and if there's snow outside, you know, it's sleeting. Our plants are completely coddled inside the greenhouse. So they're, they're truly getting the nutrients they need, you know, the light levels they need. Yeah. And um, yeah, we can do it all year round. And this is can, called a pod? Yeah, this is a, a little seedling. And these little babies make their way out into our community all year round. So we work with local schools and they get planted into school gardens or, you know, in the winter time, they're also, we're seeing some of our community partners have like hydroponic or aeroponic systems. So they're using them for math and science class and students are able to kind of, they're learning about, you know, simple mathematics but you know yeah. they're actually measuring the plants and really measuring the growth yes how long it takes yep. how much water and really cultivating the next generation of urban farmers right hopefully and, yeah and a lot of what they would do on a farm uh, you kind of do in the greenhouse yeah you know you talk about pest management you talk about uh, nutrients um, and and you're you know also able to work with some of the local Grocery stores, I take it, yep. right? Yep. Restaurants, grocery stores. Even if you take a look at these bike racks behind us, those yep. we commissioned the steel yard, which is based here in Olneyville, um, to fabricate those for us. Which is a uh, symbol of a leaf. Yes, exactly. <laughs> kind of to mimic our packaging. And um, we also have a really cool mural by Sam White, who is a local artist. Yep. As you walk in. Yes. So yeah, we're, there's lots of local flavor and culture here, and that kind of manifests with our local partnerships, that manifests through our products, um, our retail food service customers. When you go to a farm and you talk to farmers, uh, you uh, hear them talk about a, a certain philosophy that is tied into the farm, the soil, the plants they grow. Yeah. Of course, they want to make it accessible locally, mm -hmm. which they do, yep. but we have um, here uh, a different type of philosophy that still deals with the local accessibility, but growing in a different environment. Absolutely. And, and that's why we're here today to talk about that different environment. Well, thank you so much for coming out, and yeah, really excited to show you and all the viewers about you know, our greenhouse and how we grow, the care and intention that goes into everything from seed to harvest. So. Yeah, and thank you for yeah. flying in to, uh, <laughs> to meet with us. My folks are pretty excited about it too. So I'm very happy about it. that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you. I am with Michael McCarthy. Now, Michael, you're from uh, the Amos House. That's correct. Which is in Providence. It is in the south side of Providence. South side. And um, what you're going to do here today is, is you're going to do a little demonstration of using some fresh uh, produce, mostly greens, mm -hmm. uh, that you get uh, donated to you 
Is it on a weekly basis? It's on a weekly basis. We're very fortunate to be able to pick up uh, usually every Monday or Tuesday uh, anywhere from 40 to 60 cases of the most amazing greens. And um, we use them daily in our salad. Every, every lunch tray has a beautiful Gotham green salad. So, you know, you're very fortunate because the people eating in your facilities are getting the greens probably at the height of their freshness. Mm -hmm. They're not being trucked across the country. Correct. Um, uh, they're not spending any time in a warehouse anywhere. Uh, sure they're enough. grown uh, about 100 feet from where we're standing in the greenhouses. Yeah. And uh, they're at nutritional peak value. And maybe if you want to talk a little bit about that in terms of being able to use uh, greens that are at sure. total value. Uh, abs absolutely. You know, I'll, I'll throw back a few years prior to our relationship with Gotham, where I would have to purchase greens and typically sort through them because they weren't always of maximum quality or freshness. Our community partnership with Gotham has allowed us at Amos House to serve a beautiful fresh salad to our guests who this might be the only vegetable that they have in the day. Yeah. So six days a week we serve lunch and six days a week there's a beautiful Gotham green salad. If we're doing burgers, there's Gotham greens right on the burger. So it's really allowed us to provide a crucial component, nutri nutritional component for our guests. You know, our relationship with Gotham is not just providing nutritional, nutritionally sound produce every day, but from a budgetary standpoint, it, our relationship saves usually between thirty dollars and $40,000 a year for Amos House, which is huge. That's an incredible amount of money. Gotham is our largest community partner. And how many people do you think you're feeding a year? How many meals? Hundred, between one hundred and forty and 150,000 meals a year. That's a lot. It's, it's huge, it's huge. And you know, our, our focus is not just on the soup kitchen, it's also on homelessness, it's also on housing, it's on education. Uh, we have 18 properties in Providence and the majority of those properties are affordable housing. Okay. Um, and again, all those folks who live in, our affor in affordable housing also have access to Gotham Greens. Um, so because they'll come to the soup kitchen and enjoy. So uh, it's really a, it's a great relationship. One of the things that I haven't mentioned yet is as we're standing here, I can smell the basil. <laughs> yes, the basil is amazing. From a few feet away. Yeah, the, the basil is a product that we use in the soup kitchen. So typically, because you know, we can't really be aware of nut allergies all the time. So instead of making a, you know, a pesto, we'll do a pisto. So it's just with some really good olive oil, some really good garlic that we grow and basil. And it's amazing. Or we'll mix it with some cilantro and make kind of like a, our version of a sofrito. Um, when we make our, our make rice or seasoned chicken or whatever we want to use this sofrito for. So yeah, the basil is an amazing product. We also use this in our salads. Um, my only rule in the kitchen is that you don't chop the basil, you tear the basil. Yes. Gotham greens, you never <laughs> chop Gotham greens, you tear Gotham greens because it's so fresh, you really don't need to do much to it. It is phenomenal. What are you going to prepare today? So the salad that's being prepared today is a pretty simple salad. You've got the uh, beautiful iceberg lettuce that was actually harvested on the 2nd of July. So it's really super fresh. And we just, again, we're can not... Hear, can hear the crunch. You can hear the crunch. And you're not going to just tear it gently off the stem. And it's that simple and that delicious. Now with this salad, because we have got the green goddess dressing, I like to add in some leaves of fresh basil. It's just going to take a few, little bit of basil. Again, just tear it. Because it adds a certain, uh, not just fragrance, as you had mentioned, but also a really kind of delicate flavor to the salad and maybe a little unexpected flavor as well. It's also going to hold up beautifully to the dressing. So we're going to throw in just a little bit of basil, not too much. You don't want to overpower it either because basil can be pretty overpowered. It's very overpowering. It can be. And then we're just going to grab another little head of uh, this beautiful iceberg. The crunch again is amazing. Yeah. When I make my pesto at home, my entire house smells of oh, basil yeah, it's, for the full day and sometimes you know, into the you day. You're making the basil with a really beautiful, um, the pesto rather, with a real beautiful olive oil. Yeah. And, oh, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. And so we're just going to, a little bit of shredded carrot for some, a little bit of color. We do shredded carrots all the time in our salads at, at Amos House. And some beautiful cherry tomatoes, which we also use. Um, we grow our own, but we also... Uh, have other farmers who donate produce to us. 
So uh, the, the cherry tomatoes are harvested first, of course. So we're getting an abundance of that. And I don't slice the tomatoes. I like the pop yep. as, you're, as you're enjoying it. And it's really that simple. You can add some croutons to it. You can add whatever you want to it, um, to your salad to enjoy. And then we just put a little bit of the green goddess on top. Again, you don't want to overpower it. And just fold it in. And that is a beautiful Gotham Greens garden salad. Chef, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to come and see us today. It's my pleasure. And for the demonstration and talking about Amos House. Thank you. Talking about nutrition mm -hmm. and with greens and the freshness. Really appreciate it. It's absolutely my pleasure. Thank you. The other thing that I'm personally concerned with um, is that we don't have enough media going out on television today talking about climate and what's going to happen to the United States in the future if things continue to get worse. It's going to be more and more important to grow as much food we can in facilities like this where we can grow year round. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we really started this business because we wanted to address what we saw, what we thought was going to be a, a strain on natural resources yeah. with more amounts to feed. And we believe this technology provides a really compelling solution for certain types of crops. Yeah. This is not gonna be well suited for every type of crop that's in our diet, but that's okay. We're gonna need a lot of tools in the toolkit. And so not everything needs to be this silver bullet or panacea to fix everything, but it's gonna take a whole suite of different uh, technologies and solutions that are well suited to the crops, the geographical context, the economic context. But you're absolutely right. I mean, this, this extreme heat wave and drought along the West Coast is headline news. Uh, this nation gets two thirds of its fruit and vegetables from California, yeah. um, which is you know undergoing a lot of water stress, a loss of farmland, arable farmland, um, and, and farmers. So we do believe that this form of farming, which can be practiced anywhere, in the harsh winters of New England to the you know heat of the southeast uh, or the southwest, and one can grow very reliable, consistent yields of highly nutritious product using. 97% less land and 95% less water. So this head of lettuce right here, we can grow using about two gallons of water. Okay, still seems like a lot. That head of lettuce out in the field in California is gonna use 40 to 45 gallons of water. That's unbelievable. So we're sticking a straw in the ground in places yeah. that have very low water tables and we're just slurping up all this water when we could be growing it in these much more efficient types of systems. Yeah. Um, and then if we're because we can grow it in such close proximity to the end consumer, it's less transportation, less emissions, less waste, less trucks on the road. Um, so we believe this form of farming is certainly gonna play a much larger role. Uh, and I think the, the, the COVID-19 pandemic exposed a lot of these yeah. flaws in, in, in the supply chain. Yeah. Uh, you know, you had these images of food rotting in the fields on one hand, but on the other hand, you saw empty store shelves um, in supermarkets. So uh, we do believe that greenhouse farming done this way it's not the answer to all issues. Uh, like I said, it's not a silver bullet, but it certainly can play a role in making our food system a little bit more resilient, a little bit more regional, a little bit more robust and secure, um, and in a much more environmentally friendly way. I want to thank you very much for uh, coming down from New York today and <laughs> spending time to talk with us. I know you have a busy schedule. Hopefully, uh, before it's too late, we'll be able to fix the problem with agriculture in the United States and, and bring it up a few notches to where it's gonna be able to meet the needs of the people and the consumers. Definitely, and it's ultimately the consumers who are speaking and demanding this type of product. I mean, people have a lot of, it sounds cliche, but they have a lot of power with their dollars, how they spend their dollars. Absolutely. And, uh, it's been the state of Rhode Island, I would say neighboring states, all of New England, people are proud and they wanna support local businesses and they wanna be self-sufficient. And why, why eat lettuce that's grown in California and sitting on a truck for a week 4,000 miles away when you can eat lettuce that's grown locally? Yeah. literally in your backyard. Yeah. Well, Viraj, again, thank you very much for letting thank us do this. Thank you for this. coming. Appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Okay.